Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. session of the 2023 Open Simulator Community Conference. In this session, we are pleased to introduce the presentation, Game Development in OpenSim, Leveling Up Animated Storytelling with Everything as an NPC. Nara is an award-winning author, poet, and game writer. Darina Bree has been a part of Nara's Nook since 2014. This was her first appearance in 3D story building. Siobhan Moore is an award-winning romance author and pu she has published over 40 books. She worked on Open Simulator for 11 years, meshing written stories with visual and virtual scenes that readers can walk through. She's created hypergrid stories and is bridging the gap between non-gamers and virtual storytelling. And their colleague, Shannon Albright, a romance author, graphic artist, and content creator. Mal Burns is host of In World Review, a weekly news and discussion program which has been running for over 10 years. Please check out the website found at conference.opensimulator.org for speaker bios, details of the sessions, and the full schedule of events. The session is being live-streamed and recorded, so if you have questions or comments during the session, you may send tweets to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag pound OSCC23. We have some special instructions for you, so please look at the chat as well as listen to these instructions. Before we get started, I want to share a few tips on viewer settings that will help you to see what is happening on the stage. The settings OSCC prepares you for when you sit in the audience yes, using, the, using the, the, optimal the optimal settings for setting. a presentation. However, this project has a larger scene, a larger scope, and more avatars, so you'll need to change a few things to give us a better shot at success and to give you a better shot at enjoying this. Even if we don't pull this off, it should be a fun ride. After all, it is possible. Stay in your seats to avoid roving NPCs, some of which will be invisible. Shaban has slides for you visual learners. First, please take take a look at the settings, the quick settings button. It's in the lower right corner of your display at the bottom of your viewer. Check that lower right button called quick settings. Click to open and find the max avatar slider and set that to at least 22. You have to have it higher if your computer can handle it, but we have a lot of avatars here and setting it wide open to see everyone could make things really lag for you. So adjust it for your comfort. Also, while you are there, turn off the name tags. That would be in preferences on the general setting. We'll have NPCs all over the place and the name tags will create too much visual clutter for you. You can close that menu when you're done making those changes. This next change you won't be able to make until each scene starts. Just follow along now as I explain because it will save you a lot of trouble trying to follow the characters with your camera as the story progresses. We've created a narrator NPC that will be invisible but positioned on stage in a place where most of the action in the scene will happen and she will move as the center of the action moves. Again, Siobhan has slides. Now if you go up to the COM menu, the communications menu, on your menu bar at the top of your viewer, the second button from the left, open that, click people, and then in the list find the narrator NPC, then right click and zoom in on her. You won't see her, but you know, you will see through her eyes and as she moves about. You'll need to zoom in on her again when the next scene starts. You don't need to stay zoomed in on her. In fact, in the second and third scenes, there will be things happening in the audience that you might want to see. 
you can just scroll out and then back again. And, and now and then in this environment with so many avatars. And if your camera is scroll back too far, well, the things happening on stage will appear to move in slow motion as if the characters are stuck in lag. When you scroll in the action, it'll be seen at normal speed. So make sure you scroll back and forth, check that view from the avatar's position, and have a great production. Over to our cast now. Hello, this is Nara Malone. This project grew out of our continuing research into ways to tell stories in Open Simulator. In the 11 years we've been doing this, most of our efforts have centered around NPCs. This year we decided to level up with a full visual one-act play. And so, given this setting and the season, we thought we'd share our retelling of The Holly King and Oak King a visual representation of creating a world like we do in OpenSim with the same decisions needed for environment, length of day, colors, textures, and location. This tale illustrates the king's struggles to make those same sorts of decisions at the beginning of a much bigger simulation some of us call real life. We've entitled it the Yule Tale because it used to be told over the Yule log at the end of the year. We, we will give the characters voices, so let's get started by introducing you to the characters and their voices. Siobhan? So, I am, will be speaking for the Holly King. But first, let's introduce the Oak King, which will be spoken by Mal Burns. Hello, everybody. I am the Oak King. And as I said, um, I will be the Holly King. Serena Bree will voice the goddess Rhiannon. Hello. Thanks for coming to see us today. And Shannon Albright is our lovely narrator. Say hey, Shannon. Hi, everyone. Happy holidays. And now we present the Yule Tale. Everything you will see here, animate and mm -hmm. inanimate, is an NPC. Now, let's scroll back in time through decades, in centuries, millennia, to the Celtic kingdom we're known then and remembered now as the Holly King and the Oak King. The twins shared their space about as harmoniously as most brothers share things. That is to say, their definition of harmony involved more conflict than the return of the Jedi. The only thing they agreed upon was their love of Rien. The trees should drop their leaves in winter and sleep as the animals do. No fit shelter for the birds and wild things. Stop! You're fighting over tree leaves. Maybe some of the trees could drop their leaves and some should not. Hey, a fine answer. Right you are, Rhiannon. Makes perfect sense. Fly, beastie. Of course the holly trees should keep their leaves and berries year-round. Hey, and the oaks as well. Oh, try to reptiles. No, the oak leaves are too thin and weak. They can't shed the snow. The branches will snap under the weight. <laughs> are you saying oaks are weak? Bother it all.
Polly, use some sense instead of arguing with everything he says. Are you gonna turn him back into a man then? No. Please, sweet goddess, I'm sure he's learned his lesson. Well then, as the spell was done, you must give him a kiss to change him back. You mean, like, blow him a kiss? You may try that. I don't see why the two of you have to make this so complicated. It makes more sense for the needled and glossy leaf trees to provide the shelter in the winter. The rest, like the oaks, can drop their leaves and seeds, providing food to be stored through the winter sleep. All that means is to choose the length of the seasons. Spring and summer are the fairest and most useful, and so we should follow the same pattern as we do for waking and sleeping. It's absurd. Fall and winter are the fairest and most practical. Huh. What's practical about freezing your ass off? It is the time of crafting, telling tales, writing books and making art. These things all need the darkness, the solitude to germinate, as a seed does in the dark and damp soil. But the spring and summer provide the crops and the livestock to keep you alive through the lean months. Surely there'll be no creating without food. For the love of all, stop your bickering. Split the year in quarters and give each season its equal share. If either of you say another word, you'll both be turned into tadpole men. Hop off and fly already, you blasted beast. And a relative peace settled over the land. With the coming of spring, everything was fine until the arrival of summer, when the days grew longer and hotter, and the early lessons learned evaporated in the heat, and the brothers returned to their old habits. And with the coming of spring, everything was fine. vines grow back as fast as I can cut them this bloody heat how's a man to think how's he to put story to page right when thoughts melt faster than they form ah brother now why did you have to go and scare off Maylie you've nothing better to do than lays about the garden wooing pretty lasses you're such an arse Only an idiot resorts to calling names when he has nothing reasonable to say. You want to spar? You seem to need it. <laughs> Will you act right? Think you can make me? No doubt. Ah, enough of this. Quitting already? Well, if you're gonna act crazy. <laughs> oh. Shut your gob! Oh! Flipped! Watch out! No, no, brother! The 
Father, stay with me. Someone, help! I've killed my brother, Rhiannon. He is gone from us. No, no! Even the trees weep at your passing, sweet king. Summer gave way to fall and fall to winter. The darkness and the cold deepened with each passing day, but the Holly King could take no joy in it. The holly kiss in the cold deepened with each passing day, but the holly king could take no joy in it. The snows came and drifted across the doors of the keep, and the people kept to their cottages, the animals to their burrows. Only the hungry wolves roamed the forest. My brother's gone, and there's no way to right this wrong beyond joining him in the next life. I don't deserve such an escape. I deserve all the suffering my brother's death has brought. The animals to their burrows. Only the hungry wolves roam the forest. What is that light? How can this be? What's this? It is the night of the Yule and there are no bonfires, no celebrations to mark the turning of the seasons. Is it, is it you? You live? With thanks to Rhiannon. And? Oh, and thanks to you, brother. I could not leave you. I am Summer. And I couldn't become your winter. I couldn't leave you frozen in your grief. I felt your misery, and I know you've been feeling mine. Let us join in the celebration of your... And the brothers lived in peace, mostly for the remainder of their days. The length of the days and the timing of the seasons in the, the centuries to, that followed, no one argued over. At least, not until someone invented daylight savings time. Well, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful session. And we are going to have a panel next. So our panelists are going to get set up and talk about this amazing production and their work on game development in OpenSim, leveling up animated storytelling with everything as an NPC. Our panelists from left to right will be Shannon Albright, who was our narrator, Nara Nook, the inspiration, Dorina Bree was Rhiannon, Mal Burns was the Oak King, and Shivan Moore was the Holly King. Welcome everyone, let's begin the panel.
Okay, yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to start it because I can't see anybody else starting it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I, I'm going to act as host now. I'm going to give up the voice of the oak. Uh, I keep calling him an oak tree, but oak king is the one I meant. Um, yeah, so um, this is a sort of panel we're going to actually start a little bit. Um, discussing how it was all put together. Um, from my point of view, I was just sitting there reading the script. Several times, actually, we've rehearsed it. Um, excuse the noise outside, too. An engine is revving. Um, right, well, we didn't crash and burn, so I don't need to ask why. There's an in-joke there, which only the people on stage will understand. We didn't crash and burn because we're awesome at this. We are. We finally got it sorted, and even the snow, even the snow came down on time. I it think. did. <laughs> I thought I saw some floating. And it actually stopped. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it stopped when it needed to. Okay, I've got a, I've got a few talking points here, but it's a bit. Uh, I, actually, I'm going to go for the straight one. I think I've asked this before on another panel, but um, why choose NPCs and not animesh? And I guess this is a uh, this is Vinara, really. I guess. Well, we talked. We did talk about this before. Um, for in particular, the thing that we just did, and you probably would not have noticed, but there were a total of 45 NPCs in this. And an NPC has a quarter of the lamp impact of a regular avatar, and Animesh has the same impact as a regular avatar. So, so when you think about it, if you're going to do a production that large with that many things changing, you want to do it with your lowest impact tool. And another thing about NPCs is we can really simply make fast things happen. Like when you saw the um, goddess Rhiannon turn the Oak King into a frogman, um, that happened in like a hundredth of a second. And we do that with just an appearance change. And so to change that with Animesh or something like that would have... Uh, been you know much harder scripting wise and it would have been um, not quite as fast you wouldn't have had that instant change so those well, are just a couple of the reasons all right well I, um i'm privileged of course in terms of going to rehearsals with you to actually see a, a screen share from you which obviously the audience here can't see where you actually sort of reveal the, the various objects and script, scripts you've got hanging around and um I, uh, we can't display it, but um, oh, thanks! You've opened it. You've opened the Holly King Oak King card here, for example, and it's full of different. You know, it starts off with what well, I guess is a time like um, at nine point oh one, whatever, and then spawning, so... and then a location. And you, you say it's very easy, but I look at this and think I couldn't do that. <laughs> um, you basically create a separate script uh, from what we're doing when we're talking for actual actions of the NPCs, don't you? So um, a script was telling the goddess or whatever to pick my body up and take it away. Um, we were talking as if we ourselves were doing it. But how much was, because um, uh, you did a lot more rehearsal than I did, which was just voice. How, how much of a task was this, the synchronization between uh, the script where the actors or uh, we're doing our voices and the other script where your actors are all NPCs and doing their actions. It's actually, it's actually one script. All, all of the voices and the actions have it all in the same script. And if you look up on the stage, I have these, these little things that looks like eyes and a nose and a mouth I'm setting up there. Each one of those is just a little box containing just what I'm showing you now, this story script. And you could put it all in one object and run it all but we needed to split it up so that if something went wrong, we could stop and restart easily. And it also made it a lot easier to edit different sections of the scene and not have to go through the whole story every time we wanted to make a little change. Right. So what was remarkable about it is that this, this thing, this script, this is Siobhan Muir, by the way. Yeah, it, and I, this I, should script, just, I should just point out to the audience in world, they can't see what we're talking about. We can now see it on our screen share. So <laughs> we're basically yeah. looking 
at the written script the, for, that makes the object. Right. Yeah. Right. So what's great about the script, though, is it was remarkably easy to understand and follow. So even if you didn't have 30 years in OpenSim or, or you know, in, in years and years of coding, it's something that even someone who is not a good, as good at coding as I am as compared to Nara, I could build this script as well. And I, all she said was, okay, we need to move it here and we need to add seconds here and we need to add this, this action. And it, it was surprisingly easy to build. Yeah, yeah, and, no. and when we did the immersive edge thing, it was all artists and, and authors telling stories, and this script was made, custom made by some of OpenSim's best scripters to give us the tools to do it, where we didn't have to know how to code, we could just put down the number of the MPC that we wanted to be able to move, and how long we wanted to wait until that action happened, and what the action was, and there's like a I don't know, maybe 15, 12, 15 different actions we can choose from. And, it's, uh, it's really it's easy to put together. I must admit, admit, looking at it, which you can't see, of course, um, you know, sort of, I, I can see how it would be easy to deconstruct that and actually, you know, work your way uh, with new things. But there's an example here, for example, for the Oak King. Who was that? <laughs> and, you know, it's, uh, it's got some numbers and it says Oak King writing chair. Now, when I was reading the script, I had no idea what this was. You, got, you can't read the script and watch the scene at the same time unless you're in it, you know. Um, so um, I, I think the magic is that that action was taking place while I was just reading a script. And, you know, at the time, I couldn't see what was happening. I was just, you know taking my cue at the exact time, so to speak. And, um, you know, you, of course, were controlling what was happened. Now, do, uh, do the rest of you, do you, you also specialize in a bit of a different area? Does one of you specialize in the story, another in the props, another in the script or in whatever? Um, have yeah, you got a little yes, niche? exactly. So maybe, maybe Shannon can tell you, Shannon helped me to, to do the character designs. We, uh, like, picked out images you remember that, Shannon? Yeah, I do. Oh, I do. Yeah. <laughs> we and then from... we, we opened the Fuse app, and, and we built them together in the Fuse app, and then um, handed them off to Darina, who's our mesh specialist. Yeah. And uh, Darina, you want to tell us what you did with that? Um, I cleaned them up quite a bit as, as far as just the, the geometry of them to, to make the, to lower them enough to be able to bring them in here. Um, easily, <laughs> and um, yeah, and she I rigged them. them all. I gave them the the bones that they needed to be able to move, and then brought them in and started. And she, whenever we need a custom animation, we say Darina, make us an animation. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that's her skill, and and Siobhan is the one who keeps us all in line and. She made the lovely presentation board here. She also did a lot of the scripting for some of the stories, like she did all of the props that um, stayed up on the stage the whole time. She did that. And uh, we all took turns with the scripting. It's like we said, that, that scripting part of it is something anybody could do. And we, we just each took a box and, and went through the parts that we needed for that part of the story. And for the, the screenplay itself, I wrote that at the beginning of the year. And then Siobhan went through me with it and edited it with me. And then all of us, as we were practicing, made changes to it to kind of suit everybody's style. Right. You, I, I've got a quote for you here, actually, where it's sort of, um, uh, you, you introduced this, uh, not, not on text here anyway uh the yule tale is an ancient story that you've charged uh, changed up a bit to suit a modern audience and speak to issues of our time that are dividing families and friends for example um a mild example daylight savings time for example where we uh, which we all hate but we can't agree which end of the day to put the hour to solve the problem and um the yeah. argument with the brothers obviously evidenced this. And, um, but, but then you talk about when you're making the project itself, you say we lived um, 
a hero's journey in the making of this project. And Shaw Vallon says it was like a fish out of water adventure for her, which is a famous prose being literature. So <laughs> you want to comment on those? <laughs> The water idea is a, is, a, is a trope. It's a, it's a very yeah. famous trope in literature. And what it usually means is someone taken from usually our world and then thrown into something that they don't know anything about. Which, for me, when I first started working with Nara and Nara's Nook, she said, oh, we're just going to do this with NPCs. And I'm like, I don't even know what an NPC is. <laughs> it was, I was a fish out of water. So doing this was kind of like, oh, okay, so we could just make the script work. And hey. it was a learning thing for me. Hey, Nara, did you see the question? It's an awesome question that I think that you would really would like to see you answer. Um, right. The question, it's, it's, uh, actually, maybe Leah can help us. I know she's uh, still on with us. Um, in terms of audience questions that are coming in, I have to twist my neck to see them. So. Okay, well, maybe the Leah question, can keep an eye on them. Yeah. The Absolutely. Is, Here, I'll take a look. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I found put it in the question, chat. actually. Do you want me to just answer it? Sure. Well, okay. is, it, is this the question from Franz Charming? Nara, is this a system that yes. you will open source? And or can, can educators hire you to create a play for them? Yes, they can. And yes, it's open source. We put all of the... the tools that we use to make this presentation in our booth uh, in Expo 3. So you can just go there and grab those boxes. And there's even a couple of little demo items. You'll see the, the Oak King and the Holly King sitting there. And Siobhan made just a little sample disc of uh, the goddess Rhiannon. If you click that disc, you'll see her come up and res the little flying dragon and such. So. Um, Yes, and friends is right. The script that we're talking about is not your typical open sim script. Uh, it was written by Fred Bacowson, Anya, and I can't say her last name, but I can spell it C A O I M H E, Kiva. I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's it. Kiva. And yeah. Anya's, Anya's no longer with us, but she wrote a lot of this. Uh, Neo, Neothar Cortex wrote part of it. I think some of it came from Wizardry and Steamworks, and some from Jesse Campbell, who she is no longer with us either. So, but all of this was written open source and contributed to us to promote our like hypergrid storytelling projects and to do storytelling in OpenSim. And it's there for anyone to use. And we are all, you know, we love what we do here and we're happy to help people if they're trying to do this. Okay, I've got another question. Uh, unless Leslie's got any more from the audience. Have you got any more from the audience yet? Um, okay, um, my, my other question is to, you know, the team there, basically. Um, if we had a wish list of what features we'd like to see um, added to OpenSea, in, in relation, of course, to projects like this, not general, well, generally as well, if you want, um, would it be, um, what would it be, basically, the Open Metaverse Initiative, WebGL implementation, implementing features like open source game engines like God, uh, Goddo, I don't think that's how you pronounce it. Um, are there any things you would put to a wish list, uh, technically, you know, that would help um, the team doing these, this sort of thing? I think WebGL, if we could some way make, because we've already done our own experiments, just um, Siobhan and Darina and I have done experiments with taking things from other platforms and bringing them into OpenSim in WebGL. But what we would yeah. really love to be able to do is take things from OpenSim and put them in WebGL to bring, because it's such a learning curve, but WebGL is not. So if you could put like a WebGL story or a WebGL region that people can go into and interact with and, and encourage them to then look deeper into OpenSim and come in here and see what all is going on in here, I think it would be just such a powerful tool to bring more and different kinds of uh, creators into OpenSim. 
That's great. Uh, Thank you. You know, Mal, there's a question for you um, for our panel. The question is, is the use of AI an option for future yeah. storytelling and game development in virtual worlds? Well, I saw that. I mean, um, uh, the answer is, uh, you know, obviously, yes. AI is has a future in just about everything. Uh, there are separate issues as to what we should and shouldn't do with it. I mean, if I was alive 120 years ago and somebody was having a referendum on whether domestic motor cars should be allowed, I rather think we'd have voted against it if we could have seen the future. <laughs> and I wonder if AI is something like that. <laughs> if we don't tame it at this point in time, we may have, you know, and that 100 years time, we may not even recognize the planet we're on. And it may have nothing to do with the environment and everything to do with AIs being the primary life form. So, you know, we've got to watch what we're doing. But I think as an age of storytelling, I'm sure now will agree with me, I hand it to her, but I would say it, it, it inevitably will be um, in terms of the, um, yeah, the actual storytelling and the writing, you know. We all oh, have very tickered. different perspectives. Um, yeah, did you see, I she's also talking about AI-driven AI NPCs. AI yeah. NPC. I've already done that. I've already brought, uh, I, I did not use, like I don't use the open AI stuff and I don't use any of the commercial AIs. I used uh, an open source, small, large language model. And um, I brought, I uh, connected my NPCs because when I first came to OpenSim, the, the first thing I did was take an NPC and connect it to AMO, which is an older version of AI. And so then I took a small language model that's open source. You don't have to pay anybody for it because, you know, as authors and artists, we all have issues with the fact that a lot of our work has wound up in these engines without any compensation to us. So but our consent. We, yeah, so there are, um, <laughs> there are something that's uh, I've been avoiding the AI things like browser plugins and stuff like the play, but I recently on the Mac downloaded a couple which run completely locally and you actually have to work at getting them online to actually check check their database and stuff. Yeah. But they, they they learn from you and they only learn from you. So you can right. they learn from the data and set. Something yeah, you control Exactly. So, you know, I can use that kind of AI to do something for me and it would do it. It would give me an answer or produce something, but it's all it's all locally. It never contacts the. Um, it yeah. doesn't even work across the network. Yeah, probably. those are they run on your own computer, and that's yeah. what I used. And so it's not something like I can put out there for everybody to play with. But you can find that stuff if you look at um, local llama in Reddit. There, there's always somebody posting there about the newest open source language models. They will point you to places on GitHub where you can get the open source language models. And those models are not harvesting your data and feeding it back to these big giant corporations who uh, just came through and scraped all the creators work and uh, are trying to make billions off of it. So you know, Chat GPT I, I did like that too. Yeah, I like giving the NPCs voices, but I don't want to give them a chat GPT voice. <laughs> Quite. Uh, well, just make them all into robots, which they're half, half they are. What is left for um, humans to do, according to Web Rain? What is left? We, we make the art that AI is based on. So AI is saying AI is better than humans is ridiculous because they used our data to become what they are. So they can't make better art than us. We are still always... Yeah. The original source yeah i mean they get once they're trained enough they can do an awful lot but you've got to remember the training uh, was done somewhere and yeah uh, i think we're discussing this later aren't she but um you Lisa's know this is right chat like, gpt is right. open chat AI. gpt yeah. is open ai but open ai is not open source right they never change their name <laughs> you probably read <laughs> but all they're the not time. open source you probably read all the fuss about the CEO recently. And uh, I mean, a lot came from the fact that they actually have two divisions. Yeah. They have a commercial division and the board of that division is interested in exploiting the technology and obviously making money. The other division is the do good division. <laughs> and I think there was a bit of a conflict between those two divisions as AI is becoming so big, you know. A lot of that. people like to say AI is a tool too, but it's it, yeah, it, 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 it would be a tool if it hadn't scraped the data unethically 
And yeah, exactly. um, right now, there's no way to use it ethically. So until there are restrictions and that protect the artists, it, it's not just a tool. It's actually harming people. But yeah, that's I a political discussion that I don't want to get into. So yeah, let's talk need, about something else. We need yeah. to tra train it in ethics, don't we? <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Right. Well, um, yeah. Um, oh, hang on. Yeah, yeah Leah, were there any more coming in? I thought I lost the last one. Uh, Hero's Journey... Oh, so, oh, yeah, actually, I was going to comment on something I've seen already. I, in my many visits to you, Nara, in various things, of course, I'm very familiar with the idea that um, you, you, you've got a, like, a, a set of wall, right? And I go and move up to the wall, and the wall dissolves and becomes the interface of a, a WebGL world. And we and can walk, literally, I've done this with you, walk from OpenSIM into that wall and thus into a web world and it's fascinating i haven't what i haven't seen is where i can walk into the web world a few a few yards and then turn around and actually see a scene behind me that mimics where i've just come from but that's more of an artistic um, sort of thing but i love playing with that idea of you know interop even in very simple forms so i can see right, you uh, yeah we yeah. We had a region of books where they were all run uh, WebGL worlds and you touch the book and then you can play the uh, WebGL game that we created there. So that's in the, um, what do we call that region? The um, Storybook Islands, was that it, yeah. Siobhan, do you remember? Yeah, that was the Storybook Islands. Yeah, yep. the Storybook Islands. VRML, that's interesting. <laughs> that's going back away. That's uh, to with Tony uh, Parisi, isn't it? Yeah, VRML, I think, yeah. <laughs> years ago. 30 years ago, if not like, it might even have been, eight, well, I don't know, that is all technology, but it's a shame, really, it, it was never really pursued. Um, <clears throat> because... Um, yeah, I'm hoping VRML. that they will take something like Godot and integrate it with OpenSim in a way that we can use WebGL here to, yeah. you know, interface with the web instead of all of it being in world. We were talking, at, uh, well, I was talking to somebody yesterday. There was an example that um, the Open Met Metaverse Interval people did. Uh, they were here uh, last year. Um, and you, they were actually able to go into um, a WebXR world. And they were able to, which appears on the tab in the web browser, but it looks like a world, not too complex, of course, but basically it. And then you, um, you, you explore that world, but you come across a teleporter, like a hypergate. And you go through that hypergate mm -hmm. into a completely different web world. And it raises the specter of, would you open a tab and go and search for hypergates and hypergate to other web worlds? Or would you simply open a separate tab for each of those web worlds? Because it's doing both at once, if you see what I mean. It's to, you know, if you take the teleport from the tab you're in, you obviously stays in the same tab. Whereas, you know, if you do it via the browser, you open up separate tabs and switch between them. And it's intriguing, you know, which one will we choose? I don't know. <laughs> is that what the Open Metaverse Initiative is doing? They're, they're trying to integrate open yeah, well, it, with, it's uh, actually, things yeah, it's so we actually, can hypergrid? Uh, well, they're looking at interop. Okay. They're, they, uh, Omi, I'm talking about, and we interviewed them here last year. Um, uh, the name that I always say Open Metaverse Initiative, but it's not. It's Open Metaverse Interop. In other words, their okay. um, uh, uh, their concern is interoperability. So they're doing a lot of things about file types that can exist in different places at the same time. Uh, in other words, they're compatible it's with really different exciting. platforms. And and moving from one WebXR instance into another seamlessly because we we complain that you know sort of um various worlds have nothing in common and we can't go, go from one to another but when if you consider the common layer in WebXR is the web so in fact you know the web is behaving or javascript and everything else that runs on it it's behaving like the platform and so different web worlds actually share the same platform you know simplistic so way. I think you could just make a portal to move between web worlds, right? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I, you know, the, the, I love the way we can walk into your gates here, you know. Unfortunately, we can't walk back 
you know, because we, you know, we can, of course, we press the escape button, which closes the, you know, the gates of the world we've walked into. But I mean, you know, you can't just turn back around and walk back where you came from. But in the future, who knows, you know, um, or this may be possible. So one of my last questions, I'm just looking at, oh yeah, we've got about five minutes left. The crucial question, what next for the Neek team? <laughs> um, so we're going to be spending the next year I promise Yvonne we're going to be spending the next year finishing up a big project we're doing in Unity for, called the Storyteller's Castle and um, we've been working on that for a couple years now and our focus this year is going to be wrapping that project and another one Darina and I were doing um, for Games for Empathy uh, We've been working on that project for a couple of years, and we're going to wrap that one, too. So we've got a busy year ahead of us, and we probably will not be doing a, another project for OpenSim next year because this one took us all year. We started working on this in January, and so, you know, we just won't have time to do it. But uh, we'll be back to watch everybody else and what they come up with. <laughs> Yeah, being the observer, that's the... <laughs> we become the voyeur or something. Yeah, that's so good. You mentioned Unity. I mean, um, do any of your projects involve actually building in Unity, which, of course, is principally Mesh, and then bringing that into OpenSim, or are you thinking much more of building things in Unity? Yeah, we do, we do that quite a bit. In fact, some of the things that we used here in today's project were built in Unity and brought into uh, to OpenSim. Uh, as the avatars were built in um, an application called Fuse and brought into OpenSim, but we can use them in both Unity and OpenSim. So exactly. we're trying to find ways to, to merge our two loves, Unity and OpenSim. Yeah. And of course, uh, not to put a finer point on it, if you also in Unity, it's, uh, it's missing the real time sharing altering that we have here which i think is the keys yeah there's no community <laughs> for that yeah, yeah. well you know i, I like this I, community i met a prim i hand it to a sculptor who mangles it then they hand it to an artist who does the textures and stuff and then somebody else gets it to do the lighting on it and all that can be done in real time in open sim and in second life for that matter and no other no no other platform of the whole new wave that have come along has that facility, that one facility of co-creating in real time. You can meet in real time, you can travel, you know, you can walk around a mesh village that's already created in real time, but you can't actually have a team create in real time, except in Open Sim and possibly Second Life, of course. Right. I, that's why I like to create here, because we can all, you know, the four of us can get together and come in and build things here. So... Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's oh, time, right. it's time. Time space, I believe, is also Unity. I need to look so, into yeah, that. Um, I know I've went into their beta before. Go sure. ahead. No. They have um they they have uh, they have they have a second version of, um called Break Room, uh which um what they've done now is they focus Break Room on the enterprise, and all their consumer people are focused on Science Space, and you can get from Break Room to Science Space, but not the other way around. Um, but their versions are the same thing. Um, but interesting, Ad, uh, Adam Frisbee, who many of you know, he was one of the founders of Open Sim here, but he, of course, the principal person who runs uh, Science Space now. Uh, they have recently changed everything. Uh, regular users now get a lot more land, a lot more storage, you know, and I mean a lot, like going up from, you know, 500k to 5,000 gigabytes or something. Not, no, not quite that much, but um, they've really given the public free users um, a lot more value for their non-money, I, I guess you could say. Um, but they, they've put, they've laid down the law for enterprise users. That the enterprise users can't play around for free anymore. They've got to go to break room. But um, it's a very good point. Um, uh, Sun mentioned this, but in fact, most of the tools in science space, you know, there's a whole subset of Unity tools that you can use. And it'd be lovely to have that in OpenSim, but because science space is built on Unity anyway, it's easy to make a toolbox, you know, of things you can do that is a subset of Unity. And that's really not really quite the same as a team mangling in real time, I'm afraid. You know, I can't really right. just put down that's a true. bit and give it to somebody else in real time to use it. All the major stuff in science space is done offline in Unity, the way you've been talking about now, I think. Anyway, I've got a feeling we're getting. Yeah. Uh, yes, I know there's going to be a thing coming up in a minute saying one minute left. 
<laughs> oh, yep. well, it's two minutes actually, but never mind. <laughs> Very our close. Clock, our clocks aren't quite synced yet. So, any any last thoughts? Have there anything either of you wanted to say here that I missed in the bit of my prompts and everything? Um, That's all I've got. You got anything, Siobhan? That um, look for our projects coming in Unity. It'll be pretty exciting. Sure. Anywhere particularly people can go on the web or whatever to find links to Unity, by the way, that to connect with you in that way? Um, we're we're active on MeWe and uh, where else, Siobhan? Blue Sky? Blue it? Sky, MeWe, uh, Mastodon. Facebook. Mastodon. Facebook, yeah. And you can find our, our website is narosnook.com. That's it, yeah. So you'll find everything there you might need for because obviously there's no Unity station. So oh to speak. yeah, and our YouTube channel next oh, to the absolutely. details. Yeah, let me get we you back some, to that. We uh, put some tutorials and stuff we've been working on up there. So. Right. Okay. So uh, the central thing is not as new com actually, yeah, because there's things there to virtually everything you're doing on there. So. Yeah. Find the other links uh, and blue sky. That is that, that is. Oh, I'm I'm gonna have to look you up there. I'm, I'm it's the Twitter response. Uh, hey, uh, Siobhan's yeah, got I, invites, Mal. No, I'm not in there. So I'm gonna I'm, send you one. Oh, you are. No, I'm okay, already in there. But I don't, I'm already in there, but I don't know how many that people there. No, uh, Hamlet's all sent me an invite yonks ago at the very beginning, and uh, but I don't know too many people there. Um, and even people like Hamlet don't use it very much. So yeah, me yeah. either. I think Siobhan is my only friend there so far. I've been so busy with this project. I haven't really been on social media much. Yeah, Master then is a very good replacement, and I actually use IFTT to relay from Mastodon to my old Twitter accounts, which, of course, are now called something else, but what the hell. Okay. We well, thank it. you. Thank <laughs> you, Julia, for the closing what we do. That's it. Thank you, panelists, for an informative and wonderful presentation. We loved it. As a reminder to our audience, you will want to check out the conference.opensimulator.org to see what is coming up on the conference schedule. You won't want to miss our next session, which will begin at 1230 in this keynote region, and it is entitled In Conversation, Mal Burns Talks with Tiss Shoot After an Hour for Our Meal Break. We'll also have a little shopping trip over the meal break for anyone who wants to go shopping with us or to see Kelso Uxley's region with his Christmas market and go skiing. Also, we enjoy encourage you to visit the OSCC 23 Poster Expo in the OSCC Expo 3 region to find accompanying information on presentations and to explore the hypergrid resources in OSCC Expo 2 region, along with our sponsor and crowdfunder booths located throughout all of the OSCC regions. Thank you again to our panel and to you, the audience, 